Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Today's guest is a clinical and forensic neuropsychologist, a media personality, motivational speaker, clinical researcher, and published author, Dr. Judy Ho. Dr. Judy, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on your program. <laughs> no, you're very welcome. We're looking forward to having this conversation for a while. So it's nice to finally meet you and uh, be able to have a chat with you. Oh, so great to speak to you guys finally. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so obviously you've, uh, you've got a, a particular interest in attachment theory, which is something that I came across relatively recently. Um, and, you know, I'm like many people, I've had a number of relationships over the years, both sort of romantic, professional and otherwise. And certainly romantic relationships for me in the past have always been a little bit troublesome because I've had comments like, um, you know, I'm a bit emotionally unavailable. Um, I keep people at arm's length. I don't make people time for people and so on and so forth. And I just thought I had a bit of an issue or I was meeting the wrong people. And then what, uh, recently a friend of mine introduced me to attachment theory, which I found absolutely fascinating because it seemed to answer a few questions. So I wanted to, to start with, uh, I guess, what is attachment theory? Yeah, so attachment theory is at the very core just all about the impact that those first important caregiver relationships had on us starting in our infancy. So human beings, we literally cannot survive without adults caring for us in those early years. It's kind of how we're designed. That's why human babies are so cute. You're trying to elicit caretaking behaviors from people around you. And those early experiences then sort of form an operating system in our minds in terms of who we are, how we're able to affect positive outcomes from other people and for ourselves and how people relate to us and how people think about us. And so it shapes the way that we think the world works and they stick with us because during that time, our brains, we come into the world like a blank slate. We're just ready to soak everything up. So everything that happens in those early years, they feel more like rule of thumbs and are applied this way rather than maybe something that happens as a one-off when you're already an adult. You know, you might have one bad relationship as an adult that definitely hurt you, but you don't take it into your operating script. Perhaps you just say, well, that was a bad relationship. That wasn't the best partner, but I have other ideas and experiences that form who I am and how I think about myself. Yeah, interesting. And I found it quite fascinating when I discovered this this whole theory because I, I'm, I'm a parent now and I've got a four-year-old. Nice. And I feel terrible for saying this and he'll probably watch this one day and um, curse at me. But, <laughs> but he, being four years old, over-exaggerates with his emotions quite often and he cries about everything um, yeah. as they do. And, and I found myself on a couple of occasions just almost laughing at him because I thought he was being silly. Mm -hmm. And he actually started picking up on that and getting quite upset and, and he would sort of kick off and, and say, stop laughing at me. And sometimes mm. that would make me laugh even more. And I feel terrible now because now I understand that maybe that was <laughs> partly to do with my attachment style. And I think some of the, the, the conversations that I've seen you have with people previously about this highlighted the point that if I don't watch how I behave and I treat my son in certain situations, then he's going to end up being very similar. Hmm. So it was quite a fascinating one to hear. But of course, there's different styles, isn't there? There's not just the one. Yeah, definitely. But I love your story about your four-year-old because I have a two-year-old. And yes, mm -hmm. he is very exaggerated with his emotions. He loves to basically, I mean, it kind of seems like everything's a bit of a hyperbole, but it's their desperate attempt to try to communicate with us, right? So it is really interesting to kind of see that and see how we are as adults modulating some of our emotional responses, but also especially if you have a certain attachment style, like avoidant attachment, you tend to be mm -hmm. a little bit more discomforted with really big displays of emotion. You kind of want to walk away from that, make an excuse and get away. <laughs> but like you said, there are different attachment styles. There's actually four different attachment styles. So one of those attachment styles is a secure attachment style. It's kind of like the one that we're all aiming for at some point in our lives to maybe try to exude this more secure attachment style. Some of us have it a little bit easier than others in that maybe in childhood, you were already given that template for developing a secure attachment, but it is achievable at any age and at any stage of your life. A person who is securely attached, they tend to be pretty flexible in situations. Doesn't mean that they don't have any problems, but it also means that they tend to have better coping strategies to deal with challenges. And so some of those coping strategies include being able to go for your own goals while still staying connected to other people, not necessarily being um, overprotective of others or falling as much into codependency, but also being willing to rely on others at the same time. When somebody has an insecure attachment style, then there's different traits or characteristics that I've found tends to define them. So 
the avoidant personality, the avoidant uh, attachment style, as you mentioned already, Paul, um, tends to be a little bit more wanting to hold people a bit at a distance emotionally. They tend to be really defined by their work and their careers um, because it's something that generally they have a lot of say in. They can do things themselves to create those opportunities and to achieve those goals. And when they become stressed, they're more prone to becoming even more involved in their work um, because it's a, it's a route to their self-esteem. They don't necessarily trust that others are going to be there for them. So they tend to do mostly everything themselves. And then when they actually go through a stressful time, they're more likely to withdraw and to not talk to anyone. Um, so not everybody is behaving in this way, even if you're prone to an insecure attachment style. There are days probably that you act in a more secure attachment way, but it's when you're stressed out, when you're under pressure, that some of these shadows of your insecure attachment can come out. Another thing that's important to note, uh, note is that attachment styles can show up in different domains of life. So somebody can say, well, generally I'm secure, but when it comes to romantic relationships, that's where my insecure attachment shows up. So the second form of insecure attachment we talked about avoidant is um, anxious attachment. This is an attachment style where people tend to be a little bit more defined by their relationships with others and reinforcement from other people. So unlike the avoidant attachment style, they tend to want more reinforcement from the people around them rather than saying, well, I'm going to reinforce myself by maybe setting a goal and going after it. They need to know that other people in their life are okay with them. So these individuals, they tend to sometimes be more prone to codependency behaviors. They want to save everybody in their life. They'll put other people's needs in front of their own. And sometimes when they've been disconnected from someone for a while, they haven't heard from that person in a while, it's harder for them to still feel good about that relationship and themselves. So they need to try to pull that person back in and to involve them in some way so that they can still feel safe about that relationship. And of course, these attachment issues also can play a role in all kinds of things. It can play a role in your family relationships and your friendships and collegial French, uh, relationships and friendships. It can play a role in how you set goals for yourself, as we discussed. And it can also um, really influence what you think about yourself, your self-esteem and your self-concept and where that comes from. The last insecure attachment style is the disorganized attachment style. So this is probably the most misunderstood of the attachment styles. People either think that it's a blend of avoidant and anxious, or they think that it's like the worst attachment style you could probably have. That if you have this attachment style, then you've lost all hope. There's no way that you can <laughs> recover from that. I think that there's just a lot of bad information and bad literature about it. And that's not the case at all. But people who have disorganized attachment there is more of a correlation with maybe a traumatic past, especially during their childhood. Sometimes the trauma is not on purpose by the parents, right? Or the people around them. It's just, they've been through a lot. And so they tend to be more in a chronic fight or flight experience. So when that happens, it's much harder to self-actualize, to have a consistent way of coping, to go after goals, because every moment feels a little bit like life or death to them, at least on an emotional emotional level. And so people who have disorganized attachment, they tend to feel more emotionally dysregulated. They tend to be more hypervigilant, looking around them for cues of danger. And um, when they're coping, they kind of go in all different directions. Maybe one day they'll withdraw. The next minute they're trying to cling on to a person. Um, it really just depends on the situation in the day, which can make it hard for people to get along with them because they don't really know what to expect of this person. Okay. Oh, that's a lot of it. <laughs> I don't know what what would you say I am. Yeah, I think you're similar to me. You think? Yeah, yeah. I think you're pretty avoidant. What do you think? I think I'm more secure. Do you? Yeah, I think so. I've been with my wife for uh, 19 years, and uh, yeah, we're pretty stable. But I, I don't, I don't know though. The the, re the reason I think that is because your his wife often comments that he's dead inside. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just don't let things bother me too much. So if someone doesn't like me or doesn't, you know, whatever, I'll just like, yeah, fuck it. So, yeah, what would you say I am? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, you guys have been together for 19 years, right? So mm -hmm. that's a very stable relationship. So I think that as far as the attachment goes, it's probably not, um, it's probably not something that's volatile. It's probably a pretty, pretty stable It's really chilled, yeah. Yeah. No drama. For sure. No drama, which is great. But, you know, people can have different attachment styles. So maybe you and your wife have slightly different ones where your yeah, wife definitely. is like wanting a little bit more, you know, emotional expression yeah. out of you at times. 
Yeah. Uh, but there's also gender differences with that, right? I mean, that's a, a very common issue that comes up in heterosexual relationship marital therapy, where it's like there are these stereotypes where the female generally wants to have more emotional conversations or for a lengthier period of time. And the man generally says, okay, well, but we just talked about it. And the woman's <laughs> like, well, we talked about it for five minutes. I needed to talk about it for 20, right? That's just such a yeah. very common stereotype that is sometimes true in, again, these heterosexual relationships. But I would say that, you know, sometimes based on our attachment, we want different things from our partners. It even changes sometimes our love languages. So for example, if you're somebody who has a little bit of a more anxious attachment style, some of the love languages that you're going to like the most are things like quality time, because then the person is with you and you can really feel reinforced by that. Whereas somebody who has more of an avoidant attachment style, one of their top uh, love languages might be um, acts of service because you're taking something off of their plate, but you're not necessarily getting to like this emotional debate about it, right? Especially when they're stressed. It's like, oh, great, you picked up my dry cleaning, like you're the best, you know? But we don't need to like sit down and talk about what's stressing me out because that actually stresses me out more, right? So everybody has like a different way of what they want their partners to communicate with them to show that they love them, but we all have differences and we have to kind of be willing to say, well, you know what, like, this is how Danny is. And this is how he's showing love. And it may not be the way that I would show love, but that's him showing him me love in the same way. And your love for your wife, among many things, one of them is just like being there and the stability of the relationship. Yeah, I think I, I definitely do that. I definitely um, would, I don't know, do something nice for her rather than, I don't know, like talk loads, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So like a, a nice gift or like an act of service, like something that shows Yeah, you- I just I just do 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 nice things if I can rather than talk a lot if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we do all love in different ways. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I I definitely think I'm avoidant. Um and we'll we'll talk about where that maybe came from and and how I can avoid my son following my footsteps in that respect in a second. <laughs> but I think about but I think about my current relationship, which is which is also pretty stable now. Um, and I, I'd probably consider my my other half slightly anxious, but also a little bit secure as well. Mm-hmm. She's you know she's very clever and she she kind of understands these sort of theories and can kind of look past what's on the surface and, and look beneath that and and, and almost. Um, you know, sort of cognitively empathize a little bit with with my, some of my traits and how I might behave. But mm-hmm. she's very much the sort of person who likes to be around people and, you know, is, is a little bit needy in regard to company, but not to a point where it would cause distress for her if I was a little bit distant. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what she is necessarily. Um, but it feels like there's obviously good combinations of attachment styles and also bad attachment or bad combinations, right? And I, yeah. and I can definitely think back to, to some of my past relationships where I was very avoidant and they were very anxious and we just yeah. had a massive conflict. You tend to see that quite a lot. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So anxious, avoidant uh, combinations are the most common because they kind of, there's kind of like this like give and take, like chasing and like running away, then coming back. Um, it, it kind of sets its own, own pattern up. And like you said, if, it's, if you're a little bit avoidant, a little bit anxious, and you're somewhat secure too, that relationship can go really well. And even when two people are, you know, on the extremes of those two dimensions, if you have self-knowledge, if you're willing to work on it, you can still have a great relationship. But the problem is a lot of times we're just kind of acting emotionally, especially when we talk about intimate relationships. And we have past baggage too, you know, that we imprint onto our next partners. And so what happens usually with the avoidant anxious combination is the avoidant person is actually very engaged in the beginning. And they're great at making amazing impressions when not a lot is being asked of them, which is like, in the beginning of a relationship, they don't have to be emotionally that deep with the person. So usually there's so much fun to be around in the dating and courtship phases and the anxious attached person is thinking, oh my gosh, this is great. Um, I'm getting all the attention that I want, etc." But of course, once things get more emotionally, uh, more, uh, I guess there's more stakes involved. Oftentimes the avoidant person, they'll start to retreat a little bit into some of their only other activities. It's how they cope because if they get too close and if they let their guard down that much, generally what they've learned is that people can't totally be relied on and they, they're going to get disappointed. So they start to balance things out a bit. But that, even though it seems somewhat healthy at times, is really hard for the anxious attached person to take. They're like, oh my gosh, do they lose interest in me? Do they not care anymore? And then they start to do more chasing behaviors. But the more chasing behaviors they do, the more the avoidant person wants to run away. 
Um, and then eventually maybe the anxious person says, okay, well, maybe this relationship is done. Maybe, maybe this is it. And maybe they start to back off a little bit. And now the anxious attached person is saying, wait, what happened? Now they're chasing after the anxiously attached individual again. And like the cycle restarts. And so that happens quite often in the relationship between those two dynamics. Sounds like a fucking nightmare. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it sounds like a nightmare. Yeah, it's like Groundhog Day, except it's yeah. involving like a second person, like with real emotions, and then it just keeps going if you don't yeah, like stop at horrendous. some point. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because they always say opposites opposites attract, but I think maybe uh, yes. in that scenario they may well attract, but they're certainly not going to last very long. By the sounds of it, right. right? Unless you do the work, you know, and get unless you really say get honest with yourself and say, okay, this is what's happening. This is how I'm contributing to it. And here's how I'm going to try to improve it. Do you, if if people realize what what style they are can they can they still work if they are opposites like that yeah if people recognize the style that they are they have more self-awareness i think that certain certain tendencies might still come out but then you're just going to be so much more aware and be able to mm. apply the strategy to try to right the ship so to speak you know um i think it's it's when people aren't that aware um or maybe yeah. when they just kind of go into the same patterns over and over again kind of hoping for a different outcome it's like that idea of almost trying to relive a part of your life that you didn't like by doing the same thing in the next one and hoping for a different answer. It usually doesn't happen, right? Because we tend to be attracted to people, I think, oftentimes um, as people that we might have unresolved things uh, with in the past. Um, and we're kind of trying to resolve it in this new relationship. But that doesn't really work that well um, because it's another human being and they have their own baggage. We all have baggage when we are adults because we've been through other relationships and disappointments. And so... I think that once you have the awareness, though, that's the key to possibly changing. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? It's mad. So many people just not must not know. You know, they wouldn't know, would they? They go through their whole life not re realizing these types of things. Yeah, and this is like I said at the very beginning. It, it was fascinating when I came across this. I, I've never heard it yeah. before. I've never heard any of this. Yeah, both both as a parent and a, and a partner. Um, I think yeah, it really opened my eyes in, in in regard to how I'm coming across to to the people around me. So I think it is, it is very important to understand. Um, so just just thinking about where it, it kind of originates from. So you mentioned it's typically, it comes from your upbringing in your childhood. Um, and I think you said earlier, Judy, that it's not something that can be developed as an adult. But if you're a young adult and you've been in, I don't know, a, a very rough romantic relationship, could you adopt some of these traits? Yeah, this is a great question. So, you know, usually attachment bonds, at least your very first ones, they form when you're very, very little. But... An insecure attachment in a specific domain of life can certainly develop when you're a teenager or a young adult and you have like one major really stressful or traumatic experience. So I've worked with many patients, for example, who generally they were securely attached. They have great parents, generally attentive parents, right? Uh, maybe the parents were generally secure. And by the way, when you're a parent, it's not 100% of the time. Of course, you're going to make mistakes, but it's kind of like the 80-20 rule. If 80% of the time you're acting securely with your child, they're going to be secure. They're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. 20% of the time, you can make some mistakes. You can be unavailable because you've got other stuff going on. That's just life and that's being a human being. But I have had patients who grew up with a secure attachment style and then their first major romantic relationship was just devastating. It's like a player, a person who treats them like crap and now they feel so terrible about themselves and have lost the confidence that they used to have in all the areas of their life. So now with romantic partners, they have this insecurity and they have a type of insecure attachment that developed from their very first romantic relationship. And in some ways that makes sense, right? It's the first time that they're really making contact with this specific area of their life. So those first experiences are going to be more pivotal and can contribute to an insecure attachment style. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause I, I think about my, my own self again. Um, and yeah, my, my upbringing wasn't bad by any means. And I had two parents, they were both together. Um, I got on slightly better with my mum than I did my dad, but I think that's fairly common for, for children to get on with one parent more than another. But my first relationship, which I got into quite young, in, into my early 20s was was awful <laughs> um and it, it just put me off and i feel like actually going into that in the very beginning thinking back all those years ago um i feel like i was a lot more open with my emotions going into that relationship however mm -hmm. on the back of that in my later relationships i was a lot more closed off following that um, yeah so yeah so that makes sense that makes so much sense yeah mm. and, and then as a parent then so you, you kind of touched on the 80 20 rule um, you know, thinking about my 
my child and, and you know you said you've got a two-year-old as well thinking about our children i mean how can we best ensure that they grow up as a secure individual yeah you know um this is a great question and i think that you know when i think about parenting and you know us generally most parents they try to do their best it's really just about meeting your child's needs where they are. And every child's personality is so different too. So we haven't even talked about, you know, the parents default attachment style, and then maybe certain temperaments or early personality traits of the child and how that like mixes. Um, my child is naturally extremely expressive. And I love that about him. He's like, when he's crying, he's like really crying. And then like when he's really happy, he's so excitable and so happy. It's like really a joy and a delight to see. Um, but, you know, I've also seen children that are like slightly more stoic. I mean, that's just kind of their personality. Like, yes, of yeah. course, they should express emotion, but it's just not at the same level. Right. And so there's even combinations of that as well. But as a parent, I think you just have to get to know your child and essentially be a mindful parent. I mean, you can read all the books in the world. You can like work with a behavioral therapist, a psychologist and you know, before I had my own child, aside from having experiences with my family members who had children, etc., um, you know, I had a lot of experience from a professional standpoint. I treated children, I treated families, but you know, all of that goes out the window when you have your own child because you just have to watch your child, and it's like no textbook is going to tell you what to do. So I think that's really the key: is just watching your child, meeting them where they are giving them what they need and maybe not what you need and then having less judgment maybe of some of their behaviors. I know that, you know, sometimes, especially when we're frustrated, it can feel a little bit like, well, why can't you just calm down? And like, you have certain frustrations. Of course, that's very normal, but trying to see things from your child's point of view, especially when they're so young, they have literally one or two modes of communication, you know, it's before they develop language or when they have limited language, it's like, this is them trying to communicate a need to you. And all you have to do is just be present for them. Something that I talked to another new parent about was that she was so amazed that um, even on her not so great days, um, just being there with her child. Like that's all they really wanted. They didn't need a new toy. They didn't need to go to a, a fantastic place. They just wanted to have their, their parents sitting next to them. And I think that that's really the most important thing is like letting your child know that you're available and communicating clearly when you're not and why not. Um, it, it, that's all that it really takes. It's, it's, it's a lot harder and also a lot easier than it seems maybe like on both ends. It's like, oh, just be mindful all the time. Well, that's not possible. Well, you don't have to be mindful all the time, just maybe 80% of the time. And then just kind of looking at your child and saying, well, what do you need right now? And what can I do to try to help you with that need? Yeah, no, that's good advice. Thanks. And when, you know, when kids inevitably have a bit of a tantrum and mm -hmm. their uh, emotions run away with them a little bit. Yep. For me, that's 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 still like a learning curve for me right now, as I'm sure it will continue to be. But yeah. you know, the part of me wants to engage with that on some level. As I've mentioned, I've been guilty of occasionally just laughing a little when it's been something entirely ridiculous. Um, mm -hmm. And the other approach, of course, for a lot of parents is to sit them on the sad step or the naughty step and leave them alone. Um, and I just wonder in that in that scenario where a child is having an outburst of emotion regardless of what it's about, what, you know, what do you think the best approach is there? Or does it really, again, depend on the child? Well, it depends on the child, but it's always important to start to set limits with your child. Like you can definitely do that even when they're at a young age. Um, you can explain to them clearly why they're getting a specific consequence or what is a consequence if they don't try to start emotionally regulating a little bit. But of course, you have to show them the way. Like little kids, they don't know how to emotionally re regulate. So you have to actually walk them through it, like teach them how to do it. When they're really young, it's just basically you hugging them <laughs> because that's they can't really do any tips like deep breathing. But <laughs> as, as, as young as three or four, they can learn the concept of deep breathing just by learning to incorporate that into other activities. For example, blowing bubbles, you know, most kids love playing with bubbles. It's like, oh, that's a form of deep breathing that you can teach while doing a fun activity. And so, oh, you're upset right now. Let's go blow some bubbles. It's one way to calm down. So then you have to kind of take them through that. Of course, at a certain point, they, they do have to have consequences. And even for my two-year-old, he has to have some consequences sometimes. And his comprehension is obviously ahead right now of his expressive speech as for most kids. So I've started to say things like, well, you know, if you don't stop crying, then mama can't finish her work. And then we can't go to the playground like we talked about, you know, and he kind of understands that concept. You know, he's starting to learn that slowly. But you also have to have so much patience, right? Because sometimes I think parents think, oh, my child's being willful. Maybe that's true. But a lot of times we have to just give our children the benefit of the doubt that 
they are actually trying their best, but maybe they're just trying to learn the ropes and not quite there. They're trying to learn their limits, but like, that's not a fun process, right? So having a little bit more compassion for them, for where they are in their development, but continuing to insist on certain boundaries that are important to you, because that's life lessons that they're going to take. If you don't give your kid any boundaries and you think that when, when I was saying the mindful parenting piece, that they should just run amok, you should do, let them do whatever they want. That's not what I'm saying, because then they're not getting life skills for later when people are inevitably going to give them boundaries and rules and they can't follow them. Yeah. How do you, how important do you feel that structure is in a child's life? Yeah, structure is so important for adults and for kids. And I think that's another thing that you can teach your children at a very young age. They always say that even for babies, it would be best to stick to a certain bedtime or when you mm -hmm. eat. And that's exactly why, because when the body and the mind understand structure and there's a sequence of events and they happen at specific times, that's actually very calming to your mind. It's kind of a relaxation technique for your mind to know what to expect. Um, so it's important to try to give that to a child, even during summer months, even during weekends, right? I mean, you sure, you can relax certain things a little bit and say, okay, well, it's, it's the weekend. So maybe instead of going to bed at nine, you can go to bed at 1030. But being really clear that it's only happening because it's a weekend. So essentially, it's yeah. still a type of structure, but it's applied to certain things like when you're on vacation or when it's a Saturday. Yeah, that's exactly how I, my, my son's nearly 12. So I've been through all the, <laughs> all, You've been through all all the all it. yeah, I've been through it all, but now it's like a different, it's a different challenge because he's getting his, uh, his, his teenage years are coming up. His personality is changing, but oh, wow. that, that, that boundary of structure, because I've always been very big on, you know, certain bedtimes, he has a shower beds no tv in his room you know beds for sleeping you know we've and we've moved his obviously bedtime up as he's got a little bit older but now it's like every night he's like i don't need a shower i'm like yes you do go for a shower brush your teeth go to bed and then he's like well can i go to bed 15 minutes later i'm like no but it's like every <laughs> night now <laughs> do you just 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 persist with that oh definitely so this is the best part i mean thank you so much for sharing that story because i think um, one of the findings that we know from psychological research is that one of the things that contributes the most to teenagers development and how they turn out as adults is the parents' persistence, is the parents' monitoring. And in some ways, of course, when they get to this age, they grumble about it, like, leave me alone. Yeah. I don't want you here. That's all very developmentally normative, but it's also them testing to see if you're still watching. And when you are watching, yes, there's a part of them that's annoyed, but the other part of them feels safe. It's like, oh, like, yeah, somebody does care about me. Like whether it, even something that seems minor, like, did you shower? It's like, it's not yeah. minor. It's me as a parent caring for yeah. you and wanting to make sure that you still do what you need to do to be a healthy individual. And even if they grumble about it, there's an internal piece of them that actually feels safe. And that oh, promotes all kinds of positive outcomes in their relationships and whether or not they graduate from school in good standing, um, whether or not they're able to hold down a job. All of those things are predicated on this idea of parental monitoring in the teenage years. Yeah, that's, that's, that's reassuring because it's like he'll, he'll be playing the PlayStation with his friends and I'll be like, right, you're off at eight o'clock. But all his friends, well, he says all his friends are like staying up till 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I'm like, mate, I don't care. You know, I don't care if they're staying up late, they're doing that. You're going, you're coming off at eight, you're going to bed at nine. And he can see him, he's like, oh God. But it's nice okay. to for you for you to say that in, yes. internally he's got that like love you know that support there because sometimes it feels like I'm just being a just I don't know a shit bag to him you know I'm being a bit harsh on him but I know I'm not but at the same time it's nice to hear that you know it is a normal good thing to do yeah yeah and you know even if they act ungrateful right now just know that you're actually doing them such a favor and setting them up right and that there is a part of him that is grateful for this because yeah. there's so many parents that are not keeping an eye on their children and um, they, they really do ha end up having more negative outcomes when the parents are saying, oh no, they're old enough. So I should just let them do what they want. It's like, no, you know, we all know that. And, and, you know, I know this even just from personal experience, like the kind of decisions I used to make as a young adult in my early twenties versus my late twenties, our frontal lobes, our executive functions are still developing until sometimes when we reach our early thirties. So, you know, you can't trust a 12 or 13 year old as smart as they are, as, as verbose as they are to make great decisions, because I don't even think I made great decisions when I was 23 or 24. Like, I was like, wow, like sometimes I was pretty impulsive back in those days and like thought certain things were more important than they really are. You know, um, it's just really hard for us to think long term and to think with the best part of our brain. It just doesn't even come in until we're in our like almost like early middle adulthood at that point. 
Yeah, I, I can agree more. I feel like I was a, I was pretty much a dickhead until I was 29. Mm, still are. <laughs> still are. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Right? I mean, good thing I was in school then because I was in my doctoral program. It's like, oh, that was a good structure for me to like just, you know, yeah. try to stay on a good path and like not go off the deep end, like making dumb decisions. But we all have been there, right? And so we know from our own personal experience, but your 12-year-old, he doesn't know. He's like, I'm old. Like, I know everything. It's yeah, like, he does. He, he, he's he's really clever as well. So he's constantly constantly throwing out knowledge bombs he knows better he knows this you know, it, you know it, it, it is a curse that he is he is clever <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's the smart ones that are the most dangerous because they think that they're so smart and they are he does yeah like, he is so oh, smart your frontal lobe is still not developed yeah yeah, yeah. mr know-it-all yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yep. Judy, you mentioned about um, when Danny was offering the example there about how they test and see if you're still watching. And and before that, like, you mentioned um, that obviously, you know, infants just want to know you're there. Yep. Obviously, in this day and age, we're seeing more and more t uh, sort of mobile phone use. So although we're in the physical company of other people and our children and our loved ones, often we've got our faces in a phone and we're actually somewhere else mentally. How much of an impact do you think mobile phone use around your children has an impact on them? Oh, huge impact. So this is so interesting because um, I, you know, I have uh, now that I'm a new parent myself, I have like parent friends who are also, you know, parents of younger children. And everybody has had the same experience of, is it scary that your infant will pick up your phone and like somehow knows how to click into YouTube? It's like, mm -hmm. it's really crazy, it's crazy, right? Obviously, I did not grow up with that at all. Um, I think in my teenage years was when they started AOL and we had to like dial up with a modem. Like that's what I remember, right? My first access to the internet. And now this is just crazy. Like my, my child, when we allow him to watch YouTube and we do let him watch like, you know, 20 minutes a day, um, we'll click the next button. Like he knows to, to fast forward past those commercials that come up. Like he knows how it's to like press natural, the isn't it? It's natural. He's two too. years old. That's really scary to me. Um, but, you know, technology is going to be in our lives. So we just have to find a way to be able to manage it and to teach them good lessons about it. As you were already mentioning, Paul, it actually does um, intrude on our actual feelings of real connection. Obviously, it's through the magic of technology that we're able to have this conversation. I get to be on your podcast. So there's mm -hmm. amazing things um, that can happen for us for technology. But for children's brains, it's really hard for, for them to develop and learn skills from watching screens. So that's not a substitute for them playing with other children or like interacting with you. They can't learn language that way or social skills. And so it's important to kind of balance your own use of technology because children watch you all the time, even when they're so little and they pick up on everything that you're doing. And my husband and I have had to have a conversation about this where it's like, okay, you know what? Like, we just can't have the TV on in the background where we used to do that. Sometimes we're walking around cleaning the house. We have like an old movie that we like in the background. It's like, can't do that because he's seen that and he thinks that that's normal and that mm -hmm. he should be able to watch it. So we just have really made a big change in our own lives and our own routines of, you know, we're, we have defined times where we use devices. It can't be used in certain rooms or during certain activities. And then it's essentially used as a reward at the end of the night. Like, we finish dinner. Here's your 20 minutes of YouTube before we do your nighttime routine. All right, good. So we've got some good tips on how to uh, ensure our children get the best, uh, most balanced, secure sort of attachment styles as they, as they get older. And then when they go out into the world and they're obviously meeting people, we've talked about the difference of styles already and, and how they can kind of be sort of uh, like opposing magnets on, on yes. certain, you know, with certain styles. I mean, for somebody who's relatively secure, it, you know, are there any red flags that you would suggest they watch out for when coming across maybe other personalities or does it matter less with someone who's secure? Yeah, I think it still does matter when someone is secure, but because even somebody who has a secure attachment, if they've been with somebody who has a very toxic expression of an insecure attachment style, it can be really hard for them to continue to act in secure ways. Like, you know, again, we're all imitators of each other. We all soak up each other's behaviors and their feelings, especially when we care about them. So sometimes they'll actually start developing certain coping strategies that aren't actually very helpful or effective. So I think it's important to really think about your boundaries. You know, um, we talk about this word a lot. A lot of people talk about boundaries, but maybe have a hard time knowing what those healthy boundaries really should look like. Um, and boundaries, you know, very simply defined as just kind of like where you end and where somebody else begins. And so that can be in a number of different aspects. It can be a financial boundary, 
a physical boundary, an emotional boundary, an intellectual boundary, a spiritual boundary, right? And those are the five most common types of boundaries that you should always be thinking about. And when somebody impinges on your boundary, you're going to know because you feel very dysregulated, like something is not right. Like even your intuition is just like, I don't feel good about this. You know, even if I love this person, I don't feel good about what they just asked of me or what they just did to me. Right. And so it's just really important to stay attuned to that. And whether you're securely attached or insecurely attached, understanding what your boundaries are and trying to communicate them to the people that are most important to you in life. That's really, really important. So it's not so much about red flags, like you can't get into a relationship with this person. But if you have already communicated your boundary more than once and they refuse to respect it or they try to argue your boundary that it should be something different. Maybe that's time where you say we're not a good partner for one another, right? And that can even be the case for friendships too, or even family members. I've mm-hmm. certainly worked with a lot of people who say, you know what, I, I've been there, I've done everything for my cousin, and they just keep asking for more. It's like, okay, well, at some point you love them, they're your family, but you still have to hold true to what you need for yourself. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And I assume with like with many things, this is a continuum, right? So you have some people that. I guess have very sort of minor traits and some that are quite extreme versions of, of the same thing. Do you ever see like people, I mean, I, I want to talk a little bit about, I guess, sort of healing and, and whether you can, you know, sort of adjust your attachment style. Do you ever see people kind of going from one to another or is it once you've got one, it's fixed? I definitely see people going from one to the other. And I think that, okay. again, life experiences can mm. change that. Or some people might say they're a little bit more avoidant in their romantic relationships, but actually yeah. a little bit more anxiously attached to their parents, you know. Mm. So there can be really different things that, that express themselves at different times in your life. And I think it's always just kind of knowing the roots of where they came from. Like, what are the triggers to those attachments when they come out? Mm. Because a lot of the times people will say, well, 40, 50% of the time, I'm actually pretty securely attached in general, and I behave that way. But then the other 40, 50% of the time, that's when things come up. So it's just, you know, being willing to look at what types of things or people or situations tend to trigger those insecure attachments. The more you can know about them, the more you can use the right coping strategies to manage them. And what what are the best strategies if somebody is recognizing that they have a particular attachment style that's maybe not that helpful for relationships? What strategies, you know, of, of maybe sort of healing and and becoming more secure would you would you suggest? Well, one of the most important and pivotal types of exercises you can do is inner child exercises. So there's been a lot of talk about inner child work and why it's important. And it's important because for all of us, there's like a little metaphorical little you that's still in your psyche and, you know, screams out because there are certain needs that maybe it didn't get met in their childhood. And uh, we know that inner child is there because sometimes when we get stressed, we regress to childhood Uh, activities and things to kind of cheer us up. Like for me, it's video games because I used to love video games when I was a kid. I still love video games now, right? So it's always there with us, right? We have this like pure part of ourselves that like when we watch our, our children, as we watch all of our children growing up before our eyes, I know all of us are parents. It's like, oh, it's so unadulterated. They just like, there's no filter, right? That's kind of your inner child. Your inner child kind of has no filter. And when it's distressed, when it wants something, it's going to express itself. And so if you don't pay attention to your inner child, even as an adult, it's going to express itself in different ways when you're stressed. And sometimes that's what comes out as an insecure attachment style and the related behaviors. And so inner child work, one of the um, easiest exercises to access your inner child is just to bring to mind um, a, a, a memory during your childhood years where maybe that inner child of yours was disappointed, um, learned something important for the first time and it wasn't like the most positive lesson. Uh, Maybe there was a major loss, like loss of a goal. They didn't make a sports team they really wanted to make. They lost a family member, right? Um, And just really think about that time and try to picture this version of yourself and give it as much detail as you can. You know, try to imagine the environment, the situation, maybe even what your child version was thinking. And then you imagine your adult self meeting your inner child face to face in your mind's eye and just asking your inner child this very simple question, which is, what do you need? And listen to what your inner child has to say. And then over the next 24 hours, do something, however small, to try to nurture or meet that need for your inner child. And the more you're able to do this, the more your subconscious is going to be able to release some of the past baggage and be able to behave in more securely attached ways 
when they're under stress. And that's one of the most simple and I think yet effective exercises that I've taught my patients where you can really see a difference even just in the moment that you're doing it. And do you find that people are typically quite receptive to, to that idea? You know, I would say for people who are skeptical that I was one of those people that um, for many, many years as a psychologist, I was like, oh, inner child work, that sounds like way, it's like crystals or something. Like, I don't really know how I feel about that. But I think um, I, I, I came around to the idea because I saw so much of the inner child's uh, impact when people are saying, well, I learned the coping strategies, but this situation keeps happening to me. Or like, I feel like I'm coping with the same thing over and over again. So it's mm. great that I have the coping strategy, but why does this keep happening to me? Why do I keep dealing with the same type of problem? And that's when I realized, well, it's great to do the here and now exercises. You want to solve the problem that's in front of you, but unless you go back in the past and find its roots, it's going to keep coming up. And that is going to be a frustrating experience. And so that's why inner child work is super helpful. And for people who are skeptical, I would just challenge you, like try to do this a few times for a week and see if it changes how you feel about yourself, your self-esteem, your ability to handle issues, you know, see if it clears some things up for you. Because I think that the inner child work can really clear up some past baggage that is still continuing to affect you now. Yeah. Okay. I'll maybe give it a go at some point. See how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> it's attachment-based work. We're talking about attachment theory. So that's it. Do, 100%. it do a do a do a homework assignment. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll write it down. <laughs> In fact, from time to time, I'll stick on games I used to play when I was a kid. Mm. I do that quite a lot. Me and Jack, I'll go through whatever and we'll just sit down. It's good memories, I always find. For me, it's always good like happy memories mm -hmm. like Kirsty, she she's obsessed when she was younger she was obsessed with hercules you know the disney film so yes. whenever whenever she's feeling a bit pissed off i like just stick it on the background and then she's like oh and straight away she could see like her mood changes mm -hmm. and then right. she starts singing to it and she's chilling you know and i I'd, I'd done that the other day she's not very well at the moment and uh she was like a bit upset and, I, and i'll just stuck it on without her knowing and then she she starts hearing yeah. it and then she was like chilled and she just watched it all <laughs> yes Exactly. Yeah, no, that's a great example. And I have movies like that myself, like Little Mermaid or like <laughs> Home Alone, like just really like funny things that I associate with positive memories from my childhood. Um, but even when we have children, I mean, you can access your inner child just by doing things with your child because you get to revisit certain childhood activities that maybe as an adult, you feel silly doing them. But then with a child or with a teenager, you're like, oh, it's not so silly. Like, this is fun. Um, and that's even a way to nurture your inner child is just to like allow it to come out to play with the actual children in your lives you know like yeah I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big child i i always say that i am <laughs> me and my boy i'll sit there playing games with him i'll do all sorts of stuff and i've always been like that i've always been like you know my wife's got two kids really <laughs> right. me and jack <laughs> right right yeah yeah at some point i think when we get older like there's a there's a part of the filter that puts on like our that that part of our psyche right it's like you learn certain lessons like oh it's don't express your emotions so loudly or like well like you have to be calm or you know you learn these lessons throughout life depending on our own experiences maybe what our parents told us and then you kind of start to like shut certain parts of that part of your psyche away but there's still so much we can learn from that part of our psyche it's not just about healing potential past wounds it's also like oh well like what would the child version of me do when it doesn't care about what other people think and it's really just about what i think and what i want you know sometimes it's nice to remind yourself of that it's like oh what would my inner child do like that's kind of a good question sometimes when you're at a crossroads there, there is still wisdom there to be mined you know um even if uh certain adult responsibilities or expectations will tell you that maybe it has no value at, in your stage of life now. Yeah, no, that's very true indeed. And, and you mentioned, um, we obviously talked about children and romantic relationships and you've touched on family members as well. Do attachment styles impact professional relationships? Definitely. Yeah. I yeah. think a lot of the shadows of your insecure attachment can carry through to your work um, because that's just another social environment where it can show mm. itself. Like, are you going to be popular? Are people going to accept you? Are they going to like your ideas? Are you going to be considered for the next promotion? Um, again, we're social beings. So we're always going to be thinking about those things. But depending on your attachment style, you might act differently in different situations related to work. So people with avoidant attachment at work, they're going to be really career focused. They're going to be really goal focused. Um, 
they'll get into some relationships with their colleagues, but there's usually more of a means to an end to it. They're not really thinking of them as like people that they necessarily have to get approval from on a relational aspect. They're going to get approval from them by being the best, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But sometimes that can be difficult because they may have a harder time doing teamwork and team projects. And it'll be a little harder for them, especially if their work involves a lot of socialization, like if they're constantly working in teams or like always in meetings, that's going to be hard for somebody with avoidant attachment. And then as an example for anxiously attached people, they're going to become much more invested in the social realm of their workplace. So mm. more obsessed about how people are thinking of them before they turn in a project. Well, we'll, we'll so and so think um, they tend to do a lot of mind reading. You know, if somebody walks down the hall, they say hi, but they're not particularly enthusiastic today, immediately they're thinking, what did I do? And what do I need to do to like make them like me again? And instead of, well, maybe they were just distracted or maybe they had a bad day or maybe they had an <laughs> argument with their partner before they got here. They always think it's about themselves and that can really distract them from being more goal oriented at work. Yeah, that's interesting. So I, I guess if you're in a, you know, some sort of leadership role, it's quite interesting to know this stuff, isn't it? Or quite useful to know this stuff. Yeah. Um, in order to bring the best out of people. Um, and a- again, yes. you know, sort of Danny, Danny laughed and pointed at me at one point then because um, my day job on, on occasion, I'd have to have a lot of meetings and it drives me bonkers. So I'd rather just be cracking on with some work. Uh, meetings are the worst, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. And like, like just the really lengthy ones, like why do we need a two hour meeting? Yeah, so, yeah. When, so, when I'm, so when I'm in a leadership position, I set a meeting, it's like whatever is needed to get that task done. So my meetings sometimes are 20 minutes or like 45 minutes or not like an hour or two or three. But I I really feel that and I understand that. But I think when you are a leader, when you when you do have a supervisory position, it's important to think about the fact that your employees are essentially having an attachment relationship and experience with you. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if you can exude secure attachment for them, hopefully they're going to be able to exude that back and then be the best for you, you know, be able to really move your agenda and goals forward as well as their own. Um, Mm. But yeah, it's really, really interesting to see how people work. I see that some people um, it's really hard if we start a meeting and I don't ask them something social first. (laughs) When when I start a meeting, I usually just start the meeting, you know, Um, maybe I I have a little bit of the shadows of uh, avoidant attachment as well. You know, I think that it's just like, let's just get, like, let's just get to the bottom of this. Um, but I have found that some people, they're put off by that. They really want a few minutes to just kind of settle in. They don't want to like rush to business right away. They want you to ask about their weekend, you know. So once you learn what the people you work with want from you, you can also make some adjustments just so that everybody can kind of meet in that happy medium. Yeah, definitely. I've come across um, sort of different types of personality profiling before, like the animals and the colors. Right. Um, where you've got like the sort of red and the blue and yellow and green, I think, with the colors. Yeah. And it sounds like there's probably a, quite a link there, I think, between that and this by the sound of it. I really think so. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I also um, kind of essentially modified and created a version of the animal personality test for myself. And like the four animals are panther, peacock, owl and dolphin. And so uh, my, my animal types are uh, panther and peacock. And so the panther is very much like in a business world, like business oriented, like goal ta- like So that I think in addition to some of my attachment styles, it's like probably makes, makes it why I describe myself as a type A personality. Like I definitely <laughs> am that person. And so is my husband. And so it's really interesting to have two type A personalities in relationship with one another. It's like, each of us thinks that we have the best idea and we should do our idea, you know? And then, and then my mother-in-law is like the opposite. She just goes along with everything. And so it's like really interesting when you find those different dynamics and how you work with people. And like you said, like there's all these intersections of ways that we can understand ourselves. Yeah, it's a fascinating field for sure. And, and Julie, tell us about some of the other work that you, you do. Obviously, you're a practicing clinician as well. And, and I think you specialize in a few other areas around, um, around this sort of stuff, right? Tell us about that. Yeah. So my first book is Stop Self Sabotage. Um, I, uh, I I was really delighted to see the response to that book because I think so many people self sabotage. That's why I wrote it. I was like, this is a universal problem. Maybe it affects some people more than others, but everybody has had a moment like that in their life. Like, oh, why did I do that? You know. And so um, that program is a six step program on how you can identify the roots of your self sabotage and then how to essentially reduce or eradicate it from your life. Um, so I've been really, really um, 
actually, that was the inspiration for my attachment book. It's like, well, what's the next level after finding out about your self-sabotage is like, how do we really understand the roots of it at the deeper level? And then how can we also take those lessons into other areas of our lives? Um, I'm a tenured faculty at Pepperdine University. So there I um, also teach uh, master's and doctoral students and I conduct research and I have a couple of leadership positions as well within the university. And then I have a private practice and even uh, and within my private practice, I see patients and I also do expert witness work where it's kind of like a med legal uh, intersection where I'm an expert witness in different court cases, civil and criminal. And then um, I also contribute in the media. So I've been host of different shows and contribute as a guest contributor on a, a variety of different programs. Yeah, amazing. That so, uh, really cool. <laughs> so you're a very busy woman then, huh? Yeah. And yeah, now you're a mom I, as well. I know, right. That's, so now that's the balance of, okay, saying no. That's that's a good lesson for me in 2024. It's like, well, sometimes I have to say no or table something and got to be okay with that, you know, because you only have this period of time when your child is this little and uh, needs you for pretty much everything. Yeah, no, they certainly do. Well, Judy, we really appreciate you coming on. It's It's been a fascinating conversation. So thanks again for your time. It's been great to meet you. Thank you both. I really enjoyed our conversation as well. Thank you.